Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. We are talking about tonight a once in a decade event, something that impacts all of us and something we could all stand to learn a little bit about and something, frankly, that concerns many people. But we want to get all kinds of information about the census tonight. And we're happy to have with us people who can help us with that. We have June Iljana, right? Yes. You're with a partner, you're a partnership specialist with the census. So thank you for being here. Thank you. And Fabian Bedney, your neighborhood development with the mayor's office, former council member. Thank you for being here. Happy to. And all right, we know a lot about the census, and I, I, I do want to get into all of that and why it's so important. But there. Yeah, are some people who are very concerned about even participating and and how concerned are you about that what what do you tell people who are concerned about that well basically um, if you find a thousand dollars on the street you will want to take it right I mean if it will benefit your community well this is money that the the federal government is required to contribute to each state and when we get counted that money comes to us. If, if we don't get counted, you go to California, you go to another state. So it is important for us, our civic duty is to make sure the federal government knows we are here and that we are using services and that we uh, have a right to get some of that revenue to come to the state so we can provide the services the community needs. But like you were saying before, and I'm sure we'll talk about it later, people have some concerns that are unfounded. They are based on uh, stories that people tell, but they are not really accurate. People are concerned that the government's going to somehow use this information against them. That's right. And so they don't want to participate. And what, what would you tell people about that? Well, we know that about 20% of people in the state of Tennessee probably will not respond to the census on their own. They have a variety of reasons for that that can range from having concerns about legal issues they might have in their life, custody issues, um, they might have debts and they're concerned about information getting to their creditors about where and how they're living. They might be receiving public service benefits and they might be concerned about sharing information about their household uh, constituency. Uh, for that reason. So our message to them is that the Census Bureau is prohibited by federal law from sharing anyone's individual census responses with any other government agency or anyone for that matter for a period of 72 years. So your census responses aren't going anywhere outside the Census Bureau and they can never be used against you in any way. They can never be used against you in any way and, and because mm -hmm. yeah sometimes you do genealogical you know, studies, you see the mm -hmm. census data, and so you think, oh, well, it's out there, and if I put that out there, that could be used against me. But that's data that was released 72 years after the fact. That's right. Right now, the Census Bureau is releasing data from the 1950s, so you can be assured that anything you provide to us is going to be under lock and key. What about um, people who aren't documented, this whole issue? Um, and Fabian, I'll ask you about this. You know, what, how should they take uh, the census when, when someone's coming to their, their home and asking questions, what, what should they do? They should answer uh, because the census takers are not immigration officers, they are counting the population, that's a constitutional mandate that we have that every 10 years we have to count everybody in the country. It doesn't say to count citizens or to count cows or horses, it just says count people and so that's what the census will do and we want people to be counted. You know, the, the data is not released individually. We don't know that, I don't know, John Smith lives in such and such a place, but the data is used by the business community. Like if you want to have, for example, a nice restaurant close to your house, the restaurant people are going to go and look and say, where are the people that make $200,000 a year? Well, I don't know that I make that much, but uh, people that make a significant amount of money that will uh, be a good market to put a new restaurant. So they, they use that data for business investment. And so as a city, many of us are always saying, you know, I want to get some of this business in my community. And if we get counted, that helps the business community hone in on you as a potential customer. Mm -hmm. Very good. And so they won't use that against you if you are, if you are not documented, if you're not in the country legally, they can't come back at you and, and deport you. No. They will never know because right now this this census that is done every 10 years only collects a very limited amount of information. There are fewer than a dozen questions on this census and that information is protected. There was a, a battle, wasn't there, about this very issue, about whether that mm -hmm. should be a question on the census. There was and the Supreme Court settled that question um, to the degree that we aren't going to have a, an immigration question on this census. And, that, and the reason that's important is because 
This is about how many people live in an area and the mm -hmm. services that are being consumed. Is, is that right? Or I guess I'll let you describe, both of you, why this is important, why, that, why that is important. Everyone uses the services. So the, the U.S. Census Bureau is used to redistribute, as um, Mr. Bednay said, it's used to redistribute funds that come in through our federal taxes from the richer states to the, the rest of the state. So Tennessee receives oftentimes more than is contributed, and that money funds services like schools and health care and it funds public safety and fire departments, things that everybody uses, whether they're a citizen or not. So it's important that we make sure we count everyone so that we receive more money to provide those services. What's an example of a time when mm -hmm. you feel like maybe a state or maybe even Tennessee mm -hmm. didn't count the true number of people? Uh, I mean, it, it, do you have an example? Has that happened, do you feel like, in the past where you feel like we just dramatically undercounted and really kind of dropped the ball? Well, there are probably instances where communities, individual communities, may feel that they were undercounted, and the Census Bureau has a process in place to address that kind of concern. But really, the bigger thing is that communities, especially around the Nashville area, are growing so quickly that they oftentimes will do a special census that's self-funded, and it's in between the every 10 years census. And that way, they can ensure that they have the population so that they receive their federal funds back to pay for services that the growing population needs. Roads are often, roads, water, sewer, um, often they need more money to fund that when they're growing quickly. And I'm, w I'm working on the, uh, on the mayor's office on the transportation study. We're identifying all the roadblocks people face. And knowing how many people are on a road going from Murfreesboro to Nashville, that's extremely important to assess mm -hmm. and decide what is the best way to address and for the federal government to help us with that. So. It is extremely important, and that's why I'm so passionate about it. It's extremely important that every person, regardless of their status or you know if they're blonde or bald like me or whatever, <laughs> that we are all counted because we are all navigating and using this city in a certain some way. And if we know where we are and how do we move around and how we use it, uh, it helps us better understand what level of services do we need. It's good for everybody not just for the people that are counted, for everybody. How accurate do you think it is? I mean, do you think it's 99% accurate, 90% accurate, 75% accurate? Uh, do, do you have a sense? Maybe, maybe you don't know, mm -hmm. but how accurate uh, typically is it? Well, we do our best to make sure it's as accurate as possible, but a lot of the elements that we um, we aren't certain about because we do estimates on are related to some of the issues that Mr. Bettany, Bettany has just um, raised, and that is we do multiple surveys throughout the year. We're not, this is our decennial. It's every year that ends in a zero. We do this uh, federally required under our Constitution count of every single individual person in the United States. But in between times, we do the American Community Survey, for instance, which asks a multitude of questions, maybe around, you know, seven dozen questions or 70 questions or something hmm. like that. And it asks things to the level of detail that he's getting to, which is, what is your commute like? How much money do you make? Those deeper level questions that really gives us a snapshot of our community. But we only ask about 3% of the population those questions. And so that helps us to create an estimate and to plan for the future. But the level of certainty there isn't going to be as great as counting everyone. Right. And that's why the founding fathers were so smart deciding that we needed to have a census. I mean, they're the ones that put it on the Constitution, that it was a, something that was Im extremely important to plan and to be efficient in how we grew our country. So this we're just uh, honoring a 100-year-old mandate to do it. Part of the Constitution. This is part is. of the Constitution. You said earlier that 20% would not answer? Is that what you said? Or right. what, what do you mean by that, 20%? Well, we actually can uh, drill down to each census tract, and we have an estimate of how many people are expected to not respond to the census on their own. Because this is, this is an opportunity for people to respond to the census under their own power, and then we won't send a census taker to their door. On that note, I should mention, this is going to be the first census ever where everyone will have an opportunity to respond to the census online. So hmm. we're very excited about that. We also have a new option for people to respond to the census by phone. If they're not comfortable in an online environment, if they're not comfortable in a written environment, they can call on the phone and give us their information in a multitude of different languages. So it's we're making it as easy as possible for people to respond. Okay. And if you mm -hmm. don't want someone to come to your door, 
I guess there's several ways you could you could respond, and no one ever comes to your door. That's right. right? That's right. You could respond. To, okay. I guess how, how? What's the first opportunity you'll have to respond? In the middle of March, the second week of March, every household should receive an invitation to respond to the census. And it will tell them how they can respond online or by phone. Um, and we're hoping that they take advantage of that. If you respond right away, you won't hear back from the census again asking you for that. You may have a phone call following up or doing quality control, but the chances are you, you won't have any more mailings from us. You'll get a second mailing about a week later. That's a reminder. And then the third week, you will get a written questionnaire in the mail if you haven't yet responded. Now some households will receive that written questionnaire early on in the process because we believe they wouldn't, uh, you know, 27 percent of people in the state of Tennessee don't have regular access to the internet. So we're sending out questionnaires to some places. But after about five weeks of mailings, if you still haven't responded, you can bet that a census taker is going to come to your door. And so what's the census taker going to do? They're when they come to your door, what, what will they do? They're going to have a device and they're going to knock, introduce themselves. They're going to say, I'm here to collect information for the U.S. Census. And then they're going to ask the name of the householder. They're going to ask them uh, whether the owner rent their home. And then they're going to ask for some information about that person and every other person living in the home. And that means relatives, non-relatives, new babies elderly people, uh, couch surfers, anyone who isn't being counted somewhere else needs to be counted in that residence. So couch surfers or people who aren't being mm -hmm. counted somewhere else. So let's say um, yes. uh, you have a husband and wife who are divorced mm -hmm. and they have split custody and the kid yeah. spends half the time in, in one house, half the time in the other house. Do the husband and wife just have to come to an agreement on how they're going to do it or what, what do you do there? This is a very common question because a lot of times what that results in is the child not being counted at all. So our recommendation to folks is count the child. If you know that the child is being counted in another home, that's fine, then you don't need to count the child. But be on the safe side and just count the child where they live most of the time. If they live with you 50-50, go ahead and count the child because we can always identify through some algorithms in the process comparing information. We can identify if someone may have been counted more than one time and we can call and follow up or we can find another way to verify that. But we can't add some who hasn't been counted in the census. Hmm. Okay. So err on the mm -hmm. side of maybe counting everyone. Yes. Couch want... surfers. That's the thing, you know, all right, so somebody stays here every once in a while. Nah. You know, they're here a decent amount, but they're also staying in other... How do, you, mm -hmm. how do you know to count that person? But you're saying count mm -hmm. people that are in your house for right. any period of time. When I say couch surfers, I really mean <laughs> people who don't have a formal living arrangement in your home. So if you have a renter, if you have a roommate, that person certainly needs to be counted in the home. If you have someone who doesn't live somewhere else in a regular place on a you know all of the time then you need to count them another common question that I get that I'm sure your viewers will have is what do you do about college students do they get counted at their parents home or do they get counted at school or do they get counted where they live most of the time um, it, <clears throat> if they live in a dorm they will be counted by the school. We have a process where we go in and we, we count all group living facilities and that's about to happen in the next month um, if they live with their parents still, then the parents should continue to count them because they live in that one ho household. If they live in an apartment with a bunch of roommates, then they need to make sure that one person fills out that census form and counts every single person staying there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is going to start in March. It is. So it's we're a month away. We're in February right now. So this is coming right up. Yes. We're going to start getting this stuff. And there's a big issue with um, workers, right? Do you, do you need workers? Do you want workers? Yep, and, and the census pays very well. The yeah. census pays very well. Okay, so we're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back and talk about that. Okay. Um, I'm very interested in that. How many workers do you need? Mm -hmm. What does the census pay? What would you be doing? Uh, and if you have questions about the census, there's your chance to call in. There's a the number, 615-737-PLUS, 615-737-7587. <laughs> take a break. Be back right after this.